Okay, brothers and sisters, we move to our third lecture for the day, entitled The Warrior. And I guess this is something that many people came to definitely listen to. And it's something very important to all Muslims seeking to have an understanding of this amazing personality that was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And without taking up too much time, I just uh, want to introduce our next speaker, which I guess many of you will know from either Islam Bradford or Islam Channel or from many of the places you may have seen our noble brother Jalal. Jalal, originally from the States, um, and an IT, person by, IT professional by background, has mashallah committed his time for almost full time now to the Dawah, traveling across the UK and, and many other places. I think one thing, having had the pleasure to work with Jalal just a couple of times, I would say that he has a unique characteristic that, mashallah, he is there to support every single noble cause. And we ask Allah to accept his noble effort in this regard. It's a truly unique characteristic. Um, he has some very successful and very attractive projects, such as One Eid and Al Fitra, which many of you have benefited from, from the CD and DVD sets as well. And many of the events, even I believe tomorrow, there is a, a workshop which they have arranged in London with Sheikh uh, Salim Al Amri. And this is typical of the work of Al Fitra, and we take great pleasure in welcoming them today. So, inshallah, the, the third lecture, The Warrior, uh, a hand over to Jalal, inshallah. Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مذل له وما يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن المجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثات بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Brothers and sisters, respected elders and guests and scholars, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. I didn't want to offend anyone, so I said, There are sisters here, right? He said, Yeah. Didn't want anyone to think I was calling them a sister. Uh, can, can, I ask, uh, can I ask of a favor, uh, if I can? It's important to this lecture, I want us to, I want to create as many visuals as possible to pertain to this topic. So I'm going to point at you and I'm going to ask you to move. So please do so. If you don't move, I'll take that as a, you know, disrespectful, get lost, your love, you know, I'm not doing as you say, and that's fine, I won't say it again. But I'll ask nicely if possible. All the young guys in that corner, including the one that kind, the two that kind of look old, but they're young as well. All those young guys in the back corner, if y'all can come fill these seats on this side, please. Okay, we'll take a minute, but move as fast as you can. You guys right here on the end, yellow shirt, blue cap, white shirt, you guys move to this side as well, please. If you will, please. Uh, all the brothers on the end, the two last rows, these two end rows, all of you, please find a seat on this side quickly as possible inshallah yeah on this side on this side inshallah 
If anyone feels bothered by it, it's okay. Don't move. I'll pick on someone else. It's just important. I need as many of you to move over. Take these seats as much as possible. On the right side. On this side, guys. On this side. On this side. On this side. Move over on this side. We want this area empty. Move over to this side. Uh, let me have a look. Yeah, keep guys, can you all move down? Make spaces for them. Can you guys move down a bit? This is really important. Um, okay, if I can ask you guys right here, Brother Ahmed. Yeah, sorry. All of you guys, if y'all can sit over here somewhere. Yeah, all of you. Just move over to this side. Oh, you don't want to move. Okay, you can stay if you don't want to move. If I can ask you all to move to this side. I'm just trying to get the, uh, the room set properly. Almost there, almost there. Can I ask? Okay, come on, guys. Quickly find a seat. Guys, give them room to sit. Brother's like, you're not sitting here. This is saved. Let the brothers sit down, please. Little bit more. Can I ask a few of you, three, four of you right here, if y'all can sit right there in the middle? If you can, please. Three or four of you, just move over, please. Uh, I think that should be enough. Yeah, you as well, both of you. Move over, please. Just have a seat over there somewhere. There's a seat right here, look. Right here in the front. There's the seat right there. All right, yeah, that's it. Just like I'm looking. I think we've got it. Almost, not quite, but we'll see. We'll see, inshallah. Let's move on with the topic. It is this topic, though, I, for obvious reasons, brothers and sisters have limited, if not almost stopped, speaking about things like jihad, battles, warriors, mujahideen, the great victories, the shuhada, the martyrdom, the firdaus, the hur al -ain. Many people have stopped speaking about these things because of whatever uh, strain is put upon Muslims. It is part of the believer's struggle to bring up matters that look almost dead, that look almost weak, etc. It is so important to speak about the battles of the Prophet ﷺ. And I know when you think of the warrior, the first thing we think about is swords and battle. But that's not what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to focus on the more important aspects of a warrior. All you guys coming in right now, if you guys can sit on this side. All of you guys sit on that side. It's important this side stay empty. That way, that way. If all of you can sit on that side, I'd appreciate it. I'm keeping this side empty for a reason. Jazakumullah. And uh, the brother here on the end and the brother in the back, if I can put you in charge. If anyone comes, tell them sit on that side, you know? Scare them, say no, that way. Do what it takes. Keep this area limited until that's full. So all the brothers coming in now, keep them on this side. Let them sit on this side. Keep this side empty, inshallah. We take a couple of examples, a couple of quotes from the Salaf of Salih, and it'll help us understand why studying the battles of the Prophet ﷺ is so important. Ali ibn al Hussein, he said, We used to teach the battles, the Ghazawat, they called it. We used to teach the battles the way we used to teach the Holy Quran itself. And there's a reason for this. As Zuh uh, Zuhari, he says, in studying the battles of the Prophet ﷺ, it revealed to us, within it lies the knowledge of this dunya and the knowledge of the akhirah. So profound to them was studying the battles of the Prophet that they had the knowledge of this dunya and the knowledge of the akhirah. Also, Az Zuhari says, after the migration of the Prophet ﷺ, coming to Medina to Manawwara, the first Quranic verses that were revealed are as follows. To those who, against who war is waged, it is permissible for them. Permission is given to fight because they are wronged. And verily Allah is most powerful for their aid. I thought it's important to start with this ayah considering the state of our ummah today and the many lands of Muslims and what they're going through. And I'm sure all of us have pain in our hearts knowing what's happening to the Muslims in Iraq, 
the Muslims in Afghanistan, the Muslims in Swat Valley in Pakistan and other places, the Muslims in Kashmir, in Chechnya, in Kosovo, in Bosnia, in Somalia, in Sudan, so many places in the world. Our hearts bleed for them. And I say, let's share this ayah with them. At least the part where Allah says, permission is given to them to fight, to defend themselves because they are wronged, not just by their enemies, but by us, their brothers and sisters. Not if you agree at least. Yes, they are wronged. So permission is given to them by Allah Azza wa Jal. And Muslims dare speak and say they shouldn't. And Allah, whether we help them, we speak with them or against them, it makes no difference because Allah Azza wa Jal says He is the most powerful aid to them. And may Allah suffice them. Amen. This was revealed as soon as the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina to Manawar. This permission was granted. So now we study the life of this man. Why? Let's take another moment. Why is it so important to study the, the battles of the Prophet and this warrior? The warrior was made far before the battles began. And that is what we're going to study today. But just for a few minutes, why are the battles in your own time? Why is it so important for you and I to go study the battles? I'll tell you why. Ramadan is coming. What is the most popular series of lectures that Muslims preach and teach in the month of Ramadan? Who knows? You must know. What is it? Seerah. How many of you don't know what Seerah is? Everyone knows, right? Yes? If you don't know, it's the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The stories of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Seerah. We study Seerah all the time. But they did not. The Salaf al-Salih. The Tabi'een, the Tabi Tabi'een, they didn't call it Seerah, they studied the Ghazawat. They would study the battles. And through the battles, this was the key imprint of who the character, who was the Prophet ﷺ. The only time you really can know a person is when he is most passionate, is when he is most angry, or when he is most weak. Or when he is most whatever, when the emotions are at extremes, is when you really know the personality of an individual. And I'll give you a few examples today from Taif, a few examples from the battles, the two major ones, Badr and Uhud, and some of the other ones that are not as famously known, Tabuk and, and others. The examples given in them, they used to study the Ghazawat, the way you and I study Seerah. And through the Ghazawat, they got to know the Prophet ﷺ. They knew his character, they knew his personality. If things were difficult, how he responded. Because it is very easy to do the right thing when you've got time and you've got peace and you've got wealth and you've got comfort. It's very easy to say, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to be a good person. But come under oppression, come into poverty, come into watching your daughter starve. Come into watching your other daughter be killed. Come to watching your sons being buried and people mocking. Come to those states watching the people who are with you, who trust you, believe in you, love you, would die for you. And you watch them get severed and killed and persecuted. Then try doing the right thing. So through the Ghazawat, we can see who he really was, not just the man of the word, the spoken word, but the character, the example. That is why the Salaf al-Salih, including the people of disbelief from the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallam to this day, 1,500 years worth of atheists and orientalists who have looked into this man's life, they looked at his response at time of extreme difficulty. Who was he really? And they wrote, and we're going to say, what did they say, inshallah. Before we begin, and we go into such really heavy matters. Okay, remember to tell, ask the brothers to sit on this side as they come. Okay, there's some coming. Ask them to sit on this side. Let's take a few credentials quickly. Credentials are crucial. Because we all know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And we all love him from what we know of him and what little we know of him are things like oh he is rahmatul alameen he is a mercy to mankind 
He passes no man except that he would smile. He would not walk past the indigent or the destitute without offering or lending aid, etc. This man at his worst when he had nothing and someone else who had a little. But still they were ungrateful, they would beg, please give me. And he had nothing, he would say, wait, I'll be back. And he would go find another person that trusted him and said, brother, let me borrow a few things. And he would borrow and he would come back and he would give. The merciful man, Muhammad, the most merciful of mercies of men on, on this to walk the face of this earth. The kindest, most gentlest man from the lips and the tongues of the kuffar themselves. Not even from the believers, from the Quraysh, his staunch enemies would say, there is no man like Muhammad, he is Alameen, the most trustworthy. Though we hate him, that we want to kill him, they would say, they would bring their wealth to him and say, watch over this for me this month, I'm going away, I'll be back. I don't trust anyone else. This man, Muhammad, that we know as the most kind-hearted, soft-hearted, gentle man, today we see a different side, insha'Allah. Today we see the side that rarely people speak about. The true strength from all that compassion, all that mercy harnessed in his soul that made him able to truly have al-walah wal-barah love that which Allah loves and hate for that which Allah hates this man when needed to when it was a must he cut down people he chopped them down he took them down, he beat them down, he defeated them when he needed to, without hesitation. He drew his sword, he drew his dagger, he fought with whatever he had, and he would not hesitate. And he would send them back to Allah, and he would curse them to their faces when he would take them down. This same merciful man was no weakling, he was no wimp, he was no coward, he was not afraid. This man was a warrior, what made him such? He had, has from his sunnah, a spine, a strong spine that most of us today lack, a spine. Muslim men who lack spines, we'll talk about that if time permits. His credentials for such characteristics are his expeditions. Many people said, oh, the Prophet hardly fought. There was no battles. It was just a merciful man. He loved and smiled at everybody. I'm sorry, that's not how he stopped the Quraysh. His smiles didn't work. It worked on many souls, but the swords of the enemies, he needed to draw his own. So he took on, some say, 25 battles. In all of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there were no battles in Mecca except for the spiritual battles and the patience battles against the oppression, against the tyranny. Then after coming to Medina to Manawara, here, when the permission to fight was given, some say he fought 25 battles, some say he fought 27 battles, others have said he even fought 29 battles. In those 10 years of prophethood, he fought 29 battles. And uh, the, most, uh, uh, the heaviest opinion I've heard most of the time is 27. Out of the 27, he himself personally took part in nine. He himself was involved in nine battles. And they are the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Al-Khandaq, Quraida, Al-Mustalikh, Khaybar, Fath, Hunayn, and Ta'if. And out of all these nine battles, this great warrior, what made him as such, we'll get to. This great man, this great amazing warrior, this soldier of Allah, he was only hit twice. People are afraid to fight. Oh, I might die. I might break a nail. People are afraid of battle. I am afraid. So don't, I'm not boasting or judging. We're afraid. He took on so many battles, out of which nine he himself was at the front. And out of those nine, this brave warrior and his skill, his technique, his intellect, and the protection from Allah all high, he was only hit twice. He took two wounds. At two different occasions, he was wounded, which we will talk about and probably cry about in a few minutes. 
Allah Azza wa Jal said to him in Surah Al Imran, verse 121, and remember, O Muhammad, when you left your household in the morning to post the believer at their stations for battle. Brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, if only Allah Azza wa Jal would speak about you and I like that. Could you imagine an ayah in the Quran naming you by name? That's not an easy thing to do, to have that status. That Allah quotes him, that he speaks about him, that he left his house and his family in the morning to go take his soldiers and post and prepare for battle. And in Surah Al-Ahzab, in the battles of Khandaq and others, it was revealed, uh, there's a few different chapters, Surah 59 was revealed about Bani Nadar, 48 about Al-Fatih and Hudaybiyah, etc. Surah Nasr, 110 about Surah Al uh, the battle of Al-Fatih. Every battle, majority of them, Allah directly spoke about in the Quran in praise, in mention of either the weak, the hypocrites, the liars, and the great, the Mujahideen. Al Bukhari narrates from Sahil Saidi, he said, The wound, about the wound of the Prophet ﷺ at the Battle of Uhud, he took a wound. He was asked how it was treated. Ali ibn Abi Talib came with his shield with water in it and Fatima al zahra used to wash the blood off of his face and they burnt straw mats and placed it in the, in the wounds to tend to the wounds. These are the kind of things I hope we have time to go through today. The angels themselves, credentials about what kind of a soldier he was, the angels themselves honored, dignified by Allah, granted permission, stand beside the prophet in the battles. In the battle of Badr, we know of for definite. And also um, in the battle of Khandaq, we know that they brought the storm. And um, it'll come to me. Even in Badr, what an amazing thing to say as a soldier. He said to his uh, Sahaba getting ready for battle. And keep in mind, brothers, Sahaba were human. They were not supermen or superheroes. They were normal men and they were scared. On certain occasions, they would tremble and hide and hope the Prophet doesn't see them and pick them. Battle is a scary thing. And he would boost them up. He came to them in the Battle of Badr and said, Look, there is Jibra'il. And he would point them out. So there is Jibra'il. He's holding the head of the horse and he's got his armor on. And they would get boosted. Oh, we got an angel protecting us. And then they would feel a bit better. Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al Ahzab, Oh, you who believe, remember Allah's favor to you. When there came against you the hosts, we sent against them a wind and forces that you could not see. And Allah is ever all seer of what you do. Historians write about him, keeping in mind that before any historian gets to know Muhammad, from his day to today, they all ridicule. First thing they say are things I can't say, very insulting words. They call him illiterate, they call him this, that, what not. But even though they ridicule the same people that were once ridiculing Muhammad, they would say things, they would immediately change as they would get to know him and then write things about him. In a space of a single decade, he fought eight major battles, led 18 raids, planned another 38 military operations where others were in command, but under his direct command. He was wounded twice. He also twice experienced having his position overrun by major forces and no fear until the tables were turned on them and he gained victory over them. More than a great field general, a tactician, he was also a military theorist, organizational reformer, strategic thinker, operational level command commander, political military leader, heroic soldier, and a revolutionary. These are the words of a Kafir, not a believer. These are the words of a historian that speak about him. The inventor of insurgency warfare, the history's first successful practitioner, Muhammad had. And the amazing part, he says, the astonishing part of all of this is that Muhammad had never before been trained anywhere for military combat. Takbir. He introduced no fewer than eight new strategies of fighting after which all of Arabia implemented eight brand new methods, a man who never studied war before. Just as Philip of Macedon transformed the armies of Greece, so his successor Alexander could employ them as instruments of conquest and empire, Muhammad 
transformed armies of Arabia to his successors. So his successors after could use them to defeat the armies of Persia, the armies of Byzantium, and establish the heartland, the empire of Islam al Khilafa. This is an amazing. There are many more things I could say about his credentials, but I really need to get into the actual topic. There's much you could look up yourself about his battles, but I'd like to go back. I'd like to go back to his early years. Muhammad والسلام, as a baby. Now that you know all of that, imagine that man was a baby born from the blessed womb of Amina and he was carried and he was sheltered, looked after. His father already left this world six months before being born or three months, sorry. His father's already no more. He's already an orphan. Many see this as a weakness, but subhanallah, what doesn't kill you and destroy you makes you stronger. The shaping of the warrior already began in the womb of Amina. As Amina cried profusely and suffered at the loss of Abdullah, her husband. As Amina traveled in the desert and so on and so forth. Amina cried. All of her emotions took effect on Muhammad Wasallam, Made him compassionate, made him sympathetic towards others, made his heart soft. Not an evil, tyrannical ruler, but a soft-hearted, loving, compassionate man. After which, Amina let him go. And he was taken by Halima into the desert. So now he could be hardened. And he was given the pure milk of Halima. And he was taken in the desert where he took the purest of the Arabic language. And he learned the roots. And he learned the mountains. And he learned the caves. And he got to know the terrain. And before coming to an age where you start to understand life three four years old and you start to understand and take things in and make sense of things when we take them in brothers we can take them in and understand them for good or we can take them in for evil and understand them wrong and grow up as a bad child or a good child at the age of three before such tests occurred two angels were sent by Allah to shape this warrior and they cut his chest as you know and they took his heart and washed it pure so he only saw good he only saw right he only saw truth so he could be shaped as he grew into his teenage years he watched his grandfather die not given to his uncle more tests more hardship upon a child how much can one take as a, at that age he was given all of the difficulties to shape him into all forms of strength uh, 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 um, a coarse shield around his body, around his heart, but at the same time, a sympathetic, kind, polite, honest nature, understanding what lying and truth is, but going to the path of truth always. Up until his teenage years, this man became connected, young man became connected, his heart, his soul, his mind, in times of reflection. Subhanallah, how many youth do we know? pull away to reflect or do they get bored and look for something haram to do or something else to do Muhammad would reflect Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would contemplate and ponder which shape this great warrior to be this moved on to his early 20s when once or twice he felt why am I so odd and he would try to get involved with Jahiliyyah he would try to get involved in seeing and watching haram but what happened before he could come close to all of the dunya fight music and whatnot he would faint he would pass out in two occasions he fell over and fainted and there was no third attempt realizing his soul his nature that Allah was guiding was not for these things he was to be nurtured for something far greater the warriors of this world that we know of, that historians talk about, were all in one way or another, zani, alcoholics, adulterers, or this or that. One way or another, they committed tyranny and oppression. But Muhammad wasallam, because of this upbringing, throughout his warrior life, was an honest, gentle, kind, forbearing, forgiving, merciful, in every way giving a chance to his enemies to pull back and not fight. Many times and throughout his battles, we'll see how Muhammad's nature his softness and kindness continued to uh, prosper even in times of great great distress great times of uh, suppression and oppression how he maintained that beauty and Allah Azza wa Jal created him that way in his early years he kept the company of his uncles who were great fighters so he learned many skills from them and then in his early years 
uh, in his early 20s, uh, then to his mid 20s, he was proposed to because keeping in mind at such a young age, the community, the politicians, the people who run the town, Mecca, they had already nicknamed him Al Alameen. They called him Al Alameen, the honest one, the trustworthy. Because of this beautiful nature of honesty and integrity, never wanting to lie, never wanting to mislead or misguide, no matter what the loss or gain, he was so trustworthy that he had a proposal of marriage brought to him from one of the most sought after women of Mecca, Khadija, anha, who was a wealthy widow and she proposed to him, long beautiful romantic story, I think you already heard it earlier, so I won't take you through it again. But Khadija anha, proposed, they got married and after marriage, this continued when he went to the journeys of looking after her caravans and he would travel for many years, almost 20 so years, he traveled around Syria, Sham, the deserts, the Arabia, and he got to know all the paths and passages. He got to know all the routes. All of this was so important for a good leader later, for a great warrior later. Everything was so well calculated, so well planned for this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He got to know the different kinds of camels, different kinds of horses, different kinds of weapons even, in his trade, in his buying and selling. I'll move on to his strategies. Subhanallah, blessed was he to have Medina, a great strategic position between the rest of the world that was trading with Arabia and Mecca, where all trade would happen. It was right on the route but far enough from the Meccans where he had some time to think and contemplate and plan his expeditions. It also gave him time to make da'wah. Even in this difficult time, he made da'wah through to the Bedouins, winning hearts of people. He preferred this to actually fighting. He understood that con people converting to Islam and a political alliance between tribes and the Bedouins, this was far better than a military engagement with them. Also, another strategy was really clever. Brothers, subhanAllah, I think the first, this part is really important to you and I. One of the most important strategies of Muhammad وسلم, from the day of Mecca all the way to his end was brotherhood. This was so crucial to any form of jama'ah, of working together. Sincerity to a brotherhood. I'll just give you, let's start with the example before Medina in marriage and then into Medina onwards. The marriage continued. What did he do? He married the daughters of his closest brothers and he married his daughters to their relatives and so on and so forth. And he married his other daughters to some of the other companions and he built a bond of kinship. He mixed the Aus and the Khazraj. He even married a Jewess and a Christian who converted to Islam to build bonds with them even, to build bonds with his community, with the Jews in his community even, to bring them closer to want to be interested and accept Islam. His bond of brotherhood was sincerity, subhanAllah. I'd like you to, there's a reason why I split you up in a moment you'll understand. I'd like you to look around the room. How difficult would it be for you to randomly pick with two or three brothers and try to swap your daughters, try to swap your sisters right now? Today, say, you know what, let's get married. You marry my daughter, I'll marry your sister, or you marry my sister, etc. Who would do that today? Marriage is such a difficult task today, isn't it? Especially the guys are smiling. I know, I feel sorry for you. It's difficult. I was there not too long ago. It's sad. Marriage is for different purposes today. It's for different reasons today. It's not for brotherhood. That's why so many outlaws, I mean in-laws, have trouble with each other. He transformed the social composition of all of the Arabs, their armies from clans, tribes, blood kin, loyal, etc. Made them loyal only to themselves into a national army, loyal to a national social entity, the Ummah. Loyal to the Ummah. This is so important. Our loyalty is there, brothers. When you see a Muslim on the street, a lot of us, alhamdulillah, get excited. We say salams. There's still a lot of us that see a Muslim, we want to look the other way. We're scared. Don't let him say salam. Oh, that white guy might hear me and I'll be embarrassed. You have different kinds of Muslims. The loyalty to the Ummah isn't really there in everyone. And those that do have a loyalty to the Ummah, it doesn't come as far as marriage. It stays at, let's just say salam. Maybe do some business with one another.
I love you for the sake of Allah. I'll see you at the masjid. Stay out of my house. And just as you and I can laugh at that, so is shaitan and his hizb and the enemies against Islam laughing at us. Because that's the truth. The Ummah was not a nation or a state in a modern sense, but a body of religious believers who truly loved one another for the sake of Allah Azza Muhammad's armies by contrast were highly cohesive, holding together even when they, when they found themselves outnumbered or overrun back to back. Solid formation. Never did they break apart thinking, uh, we're going to lose this, let me get out of here. Never. Instead, my brother might get hurt. He might get hurt. He's got kids. I'll, I'll, I'll look after him. That love isn't there today. His soldiers cared for each other as brothers, which under the precepts of Islam they were, and quickly gained a reputation for their discipline, their ferocity in battle because of it. The Ummah was a far higher locus for these soldiers. Their loyalty transcended above the clan, etc. Religion turned out to be a greater source of unit cohesion for them. Moving on to enhancing the status of the warrior. Now Muhammad ﷺ was very clever. He also enhanced the status of a warrior. What we in the West and people know of a warrior, is it really that important? The characteristics that people would give a warrior today. Is that it? What would they say today about a warrior? Strong, big muscle, sexy outfit. This is the norm of a warrior today. You know, greased up body or something. This is what they show in the media. This is what most people see as a warrior. But what is a real warrior? It's defined by Muhammad Sallallahu and the other prophets, but namely him, the lahya, the strength, the mane of the lion, the integrity, the honor, the izzah in his eyes, the strength, the inner belief, the faith, the brotherhood, the love, the compassion, the mercy. There are so many far more higher statuses of a, of a, of a, of a warrior established by Muhammad Sallallahu Let's start with the best, the shuhada, the shaheed. What a noble status, true martyrdom. And the martyrdom, when it is received, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi described, you will be glorified in such a way, no waiting for you. It is the pinch, like the shadow of the sword coming down upon the soldier, that is all he will ever feel. He will leave the body before the harm comes to him. And he will leave immediately, wrapped by the angel's shrouds, rushed up to the heavens, put into the heart of a green bird, and where Allah is pleasing him non-stop, asking him, what do you wish for? Oh Allah, I have Jannah. What do you wish for? Oh Allah, you've given me everything. What do you wish for? What do you wish for? What do you wish for? Oh Allah, what more could I ask for? What would you want? Oh Allah, I would want this honor, this glorification that you are raised me, you've elevated me, you've glorified me. The angels blow their trumpets when I was coming into the heavens. What was that sight like? The angels excited. Here is a shaheed coming up. And here in the heart of a green bird, oh Allah, the only thing I wish for is that same glorification again, that you take this soul, put it back in a body so I may fight for your cause, so I may be killed and I may come back to you the same way. Allah taqbir. That status of a martyr. He elevated the status of a warrior. The pronouncement that those killed in battle would be welcomed immediately into paradise, eternal pleasure, in the grave, no questioning. Day of judgment, you sit on the side, you just watch. Subhanallah. And so on and so forth. There's so many beautiful things about the martyr, but we have to be careful. We'll say a few things today. We'll be careful, but the truth is the truth. Never shy away from your religion. His generosity of sharing the booty. Let's talk about this for a moment, okay? Because of this beauty of Islam's promise to the believer, the warriors were far greater. And in booty, never in history has a leader fought, taken booty, and then said, no, share it amongst yourselves. Even as a poor man, he wasn't wealthy. He stayed poor all his life to his death. But he could have had the riches of the world. When booty came, he gave it back. He gave it to the soldiers. His generosity, 
He said, what do I want with this? On one occasion, he saw the wealth and he saw the Sahaba talking and he, he looked at them. He said, this is what you love. And he kicked it and he walked away angry. Like this is dunya, worthless. On another occasion, he's sleeping on a straw mat until marks are left on his body and Umar come crying. Oh, messenger of Allah, at least something soft. At least something soft. I can't bear to see the, the marks on your body. I can't bear to see you heart and suffering. And he said, oh, Umar, what do I want of this dunya? What do I want of this world? The Akhirah is far better. He took the booty in battle. Think about this. Soldiers fight. Some are strong at the front. Some are weak, kind of nervous. They're, they existed amongst the Sahaba. May Allah bless them. They were in the back. Some of them. No. And the Prophet was at the front. I'll give you some examples in a minute. Beautiful examples. But even those guys, what booty were they going to get? What food were they going to bring to their kids? What were they taking from battle? Because they lost their livelihood. They've lost their jobs. They've lost everything. They're forced to fight. What will they take? They're the weaker ones. It's only fair, the Prophet ﷺ said, no matter who is stronger or weaker, all the wealth shared equally. Shared equally. This was never heard of in the Arabian Peninsula before. In the world, in fact. To this day as well. And he taught this. The soldier is not only the noblest and most pleasing profession in the sight of Allah, but also the most profitable. This was, this became a slogan said about Muhammad's battles. I'll say it again. The soldier is not only the noblest and most pleasing profession in the sight of Allah, but also the most profitable. To the point where non-Muslims would come to Muhammad say, let us fight with you, please. Non-Muslims would come stand by him. We've never met such a man. I don't have Iman, I don't believe, but you know what? You are the truth. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you don't have Iman yet? Stay. Keep studying till you have it, then join. And some of them would become so excited. Okay, I believe. Allah knows best. Muhammad Sallallahu changed the ancient customs regarding sharing booty. He decreed that he, receive, he himself receive only one fifth. And even that, he took as a gift in the name of the Ummah. Under the old ways, individuals kept whatever they took, but he made a massive change. He also um, share, uh, promised a larger share of booty to strike alliances with Bedouin clans as well, some of whom remained both loyal, uh, but some of them be, remained pagan to the end, fighting for loot rather than for Islam. His weapons, uh, this isn't really, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I have that much time, but you know what, it's such a beautiful thing, you should know it. So I'm going to share this information with you, okay? The weapons our beloved Prophet had in his house. Just imagine walking in and seeing, you don't see a nice chandelier, you don't see a nice table lamp, you see a sword. You see a big shield, you see a dagger, you see a chain. Let's go through this quickly. First of all, he inherited Ma'thur from his father. It was the first sword he ever owned. He possessed uh, Al-Id and Dhul Fiqar and Dhul Faqar, which did not leave his sight. Dhul Fiqar had a hilt, a circular guard, so to speak, a tuft, buckles and a base made of silver. He also had Al Qali'i, Al Batar, Al Hadf, Al Rub, Al Mukhdam, sorry, and Al Qadib, which he, the base had a base of silver and again circular hand guards. The Prophet, upon whom be peace, acquired Dhul Fiqar during the Battle of Badr, and he saw a dream about this. When he entered Mecca during Al-Fatih, his sword was beautified with gold and silver at that time. Now these are just some of the weapons he owned and they have these names to him. Now I can break them down, describe them to you, but no, look them up instead, okay? Just so you know, it's nice to know these things about your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had seven pieces of armor, he owned six bows. Well, before I go further, let's read what Allah Azawajal says in Surah Al-Fatih. Indeed, Allah shall fulfill the true vision, which he bestowed to his messenger in very truth. Certainly, you shall enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram. If Allah wills, secure. Some having your head shaved and others having your head hair cut short. Having no fear, he knew what you knew not. And he granted, besides that, a very near victory. May Allah grant that to us. Amen. He had seven pieces of armor on six bows, had a quiver called Al-Kafur and a strap belt. 
for it made from tan skin as well as three silver circular rings, a buckle, and an edge made of silver. The Prophet ﷺ had several shields, a zalukh, al futaq and one other that he, um, he was given as a gift uh, that had a painting of a statue on it. So it was said that the Prophet ﷺ placed his hand on the statue and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the statue drawing disappear. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. That's something most of us don't think about. The Prophet, we, we see statues in the house, who puts their hand on it? <laughs> or in a picture, in a place, sorry. The Prophet ﷺ owned five spears, a helmet made of iron. He also owned a black banner flag and he called it al uqab The Prophet ﷺ also had white banners that were sometimes mixed with black um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and these are just some of the things he owned. Imagine going into a house today in England and they have these kind of things, that man's going to jail. Or something's gonna happen. Could you imagine media going into such a house? And we found al dhakur <laughs> Could you imagine what they would say about us, subhanAllah? His bravery. Let's talk about his bravery. And this is important. We're running out of time, I know. Subhanallah, I'm running out of time. <clears throat> Whenever things became difficult, so much so they were unbearable, from the Quraysh, Abu Talib spoke to Muhammad and said, could you not just be silent about all this? Believe it all for yourself. Don't trouble others. Don't anger the chief of men. Don't endanger yourself and all of us taking of it. Muhammad answered, if the sun stood on my right hand and the moon on my left, ordering me to hold my peace, I would not obey either. He was a man of bravery. Abu Huraira said by him in whose hand my soul is, were it not that men among the believers are not satisfied with remaining behind me, when I cannot accommodate, I would have stayed behind when an expedition goes out in the way of Allah. By him in whose hand is my soul, I wish I could be killed and brought to life, then be killed again. This was hadith the Prophet ﷺ, Bukhari and Muslim. Al-Bara said, he the Prophet ﷺ said, we were protecting ourselves behind the Prophet in battles. Where when the battle became very difficult, very harsh, they would run behind the Prophet. Just imagine like an arrow, the Prophet's at the front, the enemy's here, all the Muslims are like this, stacked behind him. And the Prophet was at the front as if nothing was wrong. What's going on? Why is everyone so behind me? He was not afraid. He faced his enemy, charged in. And I'll give you two more examples like this. We were protecting ourselves behind him and he was at the front, fighting side by side were one or two of his brave Sahaba. Ali said, when Ab Ali radiallahu anhu, the great Ali, he said, when battle used to become fierce and the eyes would come bulging out, we went to look for the Prophet in order to seek refuge behind him. Then we found none closing up with the enemy as the Prophet himself. He would go even closer, even though we would go behind him. This was how it happened in Badr. We were taking shelter behind the Prophet, who was then going at the enemy more closer than any of us. And who is saying this? Ali, in the battle of Badr. Out of 70 killed, Ali killed almost 24 himself. And yet he also was taking shelter behind Muhammad sallallahu What was he like? Was it because he wanted to kill? Was he bloodthirsty? Never. He wanted them to be saved. He wanted people guided, but he was brave. He stood firm. He believed in Allah. He had faith in Allah azawajal. And even in that state, in all of those battles, he was wounded only twice. Then again, Ali radiallahu reported, when the battles were overpowered, we were protecting ourselves behind the messenger. In the battles of Uhud and Hunayn, when the Muslims had fallen back, subhanAllah, in the battles of Uhud and Hunayn, when this would happen, it would be the Prophet sallallahu he would be the only one sticking to his position. Imagine this. Okay, brother, you stand here. Brother, you stand there. This, that, one. The battle happens, you turn around, everyone's gone. That was the battle of Hunayn. How many Muslims? 12,000. How many kufar? 4,000. The first battle ever where the Muslims outnumbered the enemy. There were 12,000 and only 4,000 enemy. But when the battle started, the enemy came in one go. The hadith says they came down the side of a mountain, all on black horses, wearing black outfits. They looked like one big black beast. And it was coming down the side of the mountain. All of the Sahaba ran. Allah said in the Quran, what happened? Did the valley of Hunayn become too narrow for you? Rebuking them. Everyone ran. Even in that, he looked around. Where to? 
Victory's here! Pulled out his sword. Takbir, and he would charge. Allahu Akbar, and he's kicking his mule by himself. Abbas panicked, anhu, ran back to the Prophet. What is he doing all by himself? He said, Victory's here! It's right there, 4,000, I'll take them all by myself. Victory's here, where are you going? Abbas panicked, your messenger is going this way, where are you going? And they started to run back. Out of 12,000, about 700 joined him. That's it, and they overpowered the 4,000. Allahu Akbar, takbir. And this was all because he would be calling out. Where to victory is here? And he alayhi salatu wasalam would cry out. I am the prophet without falsehood. I am the prophet without falsehood. I am the son of Abdul Muttalib. He was not a coward. And then, how he put bravery into his forces. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi forbade the Muslims to start fighting unless he gave an order, so they had to wait. He would wear an armor in the front, an armor on the back, and he would urge his companions. When the fight would happen, he would spur them up to show stamina and steadfast in the fight. He started to implant the spirit within them. What would he do? He took, a, for example, on one occasion, he took a sharp sword, held it in his hand, went out to the Sahaba. He said, right, which one of you are ready to give it its right? Who will give this sword its rights? And they're facing the enemy who's outnumbering them. And the Sahaba are scared. Who will give this sword its rights? The great Umar stepped up. The great Ali stepped up. Many Sahaba like them stepped up. I'll give it its right. Not the right response. I'll give it its right. Not the right response. Amongst them Abu Dujana. Oh Messenger of Allah, what is its price? That it be swung at the face of the enemy for the sake of Allah until it is bent. And Abu Dujan radiallahu anhu said, I will gladly pay this price. And so he gave him the sword. And every time Abu Dujana took the sword, he would take a bandana and he would tie this red bandana around his head. And he did this, he says, I am marked for death. I'm not coming back. And every time he came back. When, they, when he put that on, they said, he's going, he's going. And this would boost everyone up, subhanAllah. This Abu Dujana Samak bin Kharsha, he took this sword and gave it its right in that battle. The Prophet Sallallahu saw Abu Dujana take the sword and he started marching in front of the other companions like, <laughs> I got it. And he's walking, he's tied on bandana. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, he said, this kind of walking, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala hates it. He despises it, except in this case. SubhanAllah. The effect he had on his men, now here, I want to talk about a few men, and I know I'm almost out of time. In fact, I think I am. Uh, I want to talk about a few men, but more importantly, sisters. I know you're in there. I know you're there. I think I'm pointing in the right direction. They're over there. I want to speak about at least three of them. Uh, not any of them in there, but three sisters, inshallah. <laughs> they get scared. Who, me? One companion. The effect the Prophet had on people, how much they loved him. They're getting ready, brothers. The Sahaba are ready. They're going for battle. This great warrior is summoning his soldiers. The enemy, again, greatly outnumbers them. Few soldiers line up. What are they lining up for? Wrestling match? Battle? What? To the death. And he's lining them up. And one of them, young Sawad. And the Prophet ﷺ sees Sawad, like me, unfortunately. I mean, he's obviously probably far more handsome, mashallah, sahab. I dare not compare myself. But he has a bit of a gut. And his gut's sticking out. And the Prophet ﷺ was carrying a stick. Line up, straight, straight shoulders. Oh, Sawad. And he poked him in the belly. Stand up straight. And Sawad said, what did he say? Oh, Messenger of Allah, you have hurt me. Allah sent you with truth and justice. I want my requital. The Prophet was shocked. He lay, he lifted up his shirt. He said, you want justice on me? He said, yes. He said, okay. He lifted his shirt and he showed him his bare stomach. The Prophet Sallallahu gave him the stick. He said, go on. When he lifted his shirt, the Sahaba dropped his knees, grabbed his belly and kissed it. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Why, what made you do this, O Suad? He said, O Messenger of Allah, we are now fa faced with that which you and I both see, the enemy. We are not faced with that. 
And I desire that in my last moment with you, if it's so to be, that my skin should touch your skin. I took the opportunity. SubhanAllah. When the battle finished, many soldiers would be buried at many times. The Prophet Sallallahu used to go grave to grave. And he used to go to each one and people used to hear. And SubhanAllah, this would boost. What would he say? He would call them by name. O oh, people of the grave, O oh, Utba ibn Rabi'ah, O oh, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, O oh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, O oh, Abu Jahl ibn Hisham. Oh, after calling name for name for name of the people who had fallen, he addressed them with these words. Have you really found that which your Lord has promised you? Because I found what my Lord has promised me. But have you? The Muslims overheard this panic. Are you speaking to the dead? The Prophet said, they hear me. They hear me no less than you do, except they are unable to respond again. His diplomatic reasoning, his well-advised decisions, etc. in times of war. Um, no time. I'm going to skip this. This is about the battle of Badr and the soldiers, prisoners taken. Abu Bakr said, free them, their family, their people we know. Let them go. Be nice. They'll like you. Omar said, kill him. Don't let him go. They are the enemies of Allah. If you kill them, it'll be better for us. And the Prophet وسلم, let them go. And in terms of uh, ransom, and Allah Azza wa Jal came out with verses defending Omar saying you should have killed him. But obviously Allah allowed it for wisdom. There's reasons for that another time, inshallah. The Battle of Badr was something many lessons were taken from it. And subhanAllah, there's so much I want to say to you. I'm going to have to skip. Five minutes, huh? Okay. Okay, I'll conclude. The Prophet Sallallahu beseeched Allah Azza wa Jal for help against the enemies in uh, the Battle of Badr. But the reason why I split this room, I, you can't see it now, but earlier you saw it. There was a few of you here and you see a great group here. Try to imagine the feeling. The Sahaba always outnumbered. Try to understand how that feels. And then yet, you have this man, Muhammad Sallallahu It was not without him that they had such Iman. It was with him. He was such a warrior, such an encouragement that he didn't just preach the word. He stepped up to it and he fought and he fought. And this was the battle of Badr where he obtained victory against the enemy through such encouragement. And then you had the battle of Uhud where the Qurayshis were angry. The youth, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Another example of a warrior. We had fought Badr, but now it's Uhud. The Quraysh are angry. They want revenge. The Prophet ﷺ thought, you know what? Let's stay in the city and throw things from the wall. The youth overzealous today, we have those youth today. You have a dinner, a sister walks by, maybe not wearing hijab, or a brother doesn't have a beard, etc. Something like that. And you have the overzealous youth. They look on, astaghfirullah, etc. Ready for judgment. Ready for something. I don't know what's wrong with youth today. The way they judge each other. There's a disease in there, subhanAllah. Sabr to you actually learn something. A little bit of patience, show it. And if you see such a jahil youth, smile, say salam, leave him alone. Till he learns. But in the Prophet ﷺ's day, some of the youth came out and they were overzealous. They were excited. You people fought Badr and you got to fight and you got to show your honor. Although this is a little bit different because they're overzealous and pleasing Allah. So they say, we want to go out today. The Prophet said, no, this is different. The elderly of, the, of, 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 of Medina, they said, no, this is different. Let's stay inside. The youth were excited until they became upset. And the Prophet ﷺ said, fine, we'll go out. The Prophet became upset and walked off. And this is the battle of Uhud, which we suffered heavily. The youth spoke with the elders and they said, look, that was a big mistake. You shouldn't have overrated the Prophet. So they went to his house saying, oh, messenger of Allah, listen to this warrior. O oh, Messenger of Allah, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we should stay. And he comes out of his house fully suited and booted for battle. He sees the youth, maybe we should stay. Do not be wishy-washy. 
Stand firm by your decision. It is Allah that decides the result, not your decision. Stand firm. And it is not befitting of a prophet to take his armor off until Allah has decided between him and his enemy. And he would engage in them. And this was him. In the battle of Uhud, he broke the army into three parts. Musab ibn Umair took one, Usaid ibn Hudayr took another, and Habab ibn Mundir took a third. And these were the Khaus, the Khazraj of the Ansar, and then there was the Muhajireen. Three different parts led someone of their own to lead them in this battle against 1,000. There were 1,000 Mujahideen, roughly. 50 horsemen and at the very front of those horsemen are the two honorable Sa'dain. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and they're riding these horses shielded better than the rest like they stand front and they're leading the way. This was the battle of Uhud. The Munafiqeen they came forward. Abdullah ibn Ubay leading them and when the enemy came and they prayed their Fajr Salah, the Muslims did not the enemy. They prayed their Fajr Salah. After the Salah the Prophet came forward. They could see the enemy and they could see each other. Here Abdullah ibn Ubay said, I don't understand why we should fight and die here today. I don't think so. Turned his horse, took 300 men, one third of the army away as hypocrites and later they said that uh, uh, why kill ourselves you know maybe this isn't right for us and when they pulled away Allah revealed the following verses about them and that and that he might test the hypocrites it was said to them come fight in the way of Allah or at least defend yourselves they said had we known the fighting would take place we would have certainly followed you and that day they were far, far closer to disbelief than to belief Allah knows what their heart concealed and Allah knows all that you do. Surah Al-Imran. Abu Ubaidah ibn Al-Jarrar, he, he was one of the companions. I'll just be brief now, I'm done. Abu Ubaidah Al-Jarrar, so important for you to remember that name. Talha, so remember, important for you brothers and me and myself to remember these names. Um Amara, the sisters, they too have role models, a name you should never forget. In the battle of Uhud, this is where the great prophet of Islam was wounded. They sought a, a siege to get all the Sahaba busy so that a great number could attack the Prophet ﷺ. And he was hit from this side and that side. He was hit from this side and that side. And he was struck in the mouth, he was struck in the shoulder, he was struck in the head. Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas threw stones and injured him and broke his tooth. Hit him so hard, it broke his right incisor and cut his lip. Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Shihab al zuhr again. And the Prophet had a, sh a helmet with chain links on the sides. They hit him in the face and they broke and they jabbed into his jaw. And he said, do they strike a man and break his incisors and hit him in the face? Who calls them to Allah, calls them to worship? How do these people think they will prosper all or ruin them? And he... And he began to curse them when Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to him and said to him, not for you, O Muhammad, not for you that you should be able to judge. It's not for you to judge who I punish and who I give favor and forgive. Truly, they are the Dhalimun. The Prophet was in so much agony that he wanted to curse them. But Allah reminded him, not for you to judge. Who I should punish and forgive. So the Prophet immediately changed and he said, Oh Allah, forgive them, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Panicked, he realized Allah is going to destroy these people. This is the blood of a Prophet. He panicked, he started cleaning his face. He said, Oh Allah, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So worried was he for the people, even in battle, he would make dua for them. Allah reminded him that Allah may destroy them, they are dhalim. Oh Allah, don't destroy them. Lastly, coming back to Umm Amara, when he fell, this was their chance to finish Islam. Finish Muhammad. Oh sisters in Islam, Umm Amara saved our Ummah by the will of Allah. She saw what happened. She saw the Sahaba wounded. Talha did his best, radiallahu anhu. And every time they swung at the Prophet, he would jump in front of the swing. And he would take blow upon blow to defend his Nabi. We don't even defend the beard. Umm Amara came running. 
grabbed a sword, stood in front of the prophet, and swung with her might. And the prophet said, I saw her back to me, and I saw her front to me. I saw her back to me, I saw her front to me. She was spinning around him, swinging her sword, defending the prophet. Other sahabas came, they grabbed him. Abu Ubaidah arrived, they ran off with him off the field, took him up into the mountain into refuge. Abu Ubaidah, Ibn al Jarrah, he saw the tooth. And other Sahaba said, we will have this pulled slowly. The, uh, the, the, the link of his necklace, of his helmet, stuck in his, tooth, in his tooth, in his face. Excuse me. Abu Ubaidah said, please let me take it out. Yeah, I fear you will hurt him. I fear if you pull it, you will hurt him. You will cause my Nabi pain. Let me do it. They said, no, they pulled rank. They said, we are in charge. No, Abu Ubaidah threw himself, started crying like a child. Until they said, let him, he's not going to stop, let him do it. And he took the Prophet's face in his hand and he took the chain link in his mouth because your mouth is very sensitive, you won't shake. And he pulled the links out so slowly that he bit so hard, he shattered his two front teeth. He broke his own teeth, did not harm, bring any pain to the Prophet Talha was later at that time when they were tending to the Prophet, he said, look to your brother, look to your brother. Talha was trying to pretend nothing was wrong. And they ran to him and they found 10 major sword wounds in his body. And he was staying calm about it. After which the pain of Uhud was exposed and we found the Shuhada and we had Hamza ripped open mutilated and the prophet cried he couldn't bear the sight the shroud they brought they didn't have much for hamza so they had some darkish white material they covered him and it barely covered his body they moved it around him this warrior loved his people loved you and i more than we could love anything. And he saw Hamza. And then he saw Handala. And they washed the bodies of the Shuhada. And they prepared them to bury them. Oh, they prepared them. And they missed the coffin of Handala. They forgot to prepare it, I mean, sorry. They forgot to prepare Handala. But when they went back to him, they said, Who washed Handala? And the Prophet said, What's wrong? He said, He's been washed. Handala's been washed. Who washed Handala? And they lifted him and his body was drenching with water. Said, ask his wife. He was just married the night before. So the malaika gave him ghusl. The angels washed Hanfala. And he was nicknamed Ghazilul Malaika. The one who was washed by the angels. They took the bodies and they prepared Hamza. And they laid Hamza, the Prophet ﷺ laid Hamza facing the Qibla. And they stood over him preparing the janaza, And they said, we saw the Prophet cry more than we've ever seen him weep. He cried his soul out at the pain he felt seeing his uncle Hamza. They said, we hadn't seen the Prophet cry like this. So they all cried. Just about the sisters, subhanAllah, I'll conclude. I'm so sorry I've gone over. The sisters, Umm Amara defended him. Umm Atiyah on another occasion, very important, anha, when people gave donations, take this for battle, take this here, have my shield, have this, have some money, feed the soldiers. A woman had nothing, she was jealous, everyone was giving. She only had her baby. She walked up, Umm Atiyah said, here, take my baby. What will I do with your baby, O oh mother? Use it as a shield, O Messenger of Allah. Defend yourself against arrows, O Messenger of Allah. How what kind of a warrior was this that they loved him so much? Hana bin Josh, walking out after hearing the Prophet is wounded, the Prophet is fallen, the hypocrites have cried and said the Prophet is dead. May the hands, faces, hearts, and bodies of the Munafiqeen perish. They said the Prophet is no more. So, Umm uh, Hannah bin Jash came out, heard this. What of the news of my messenger? Oh, Hannah, 
We found your father. He is fallen. He is dead. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That is what she said. She moved on. And what of my beloved messenger, O oh, Hannah? We found your husband. He has fallen. He is no more. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Her words. She moved on. And what of my beloved prophet, O oh, Hannah? We've seen your son. He has fallen. He is no more. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Where is my messenger, O oh, Hannah? Your husband is fallen. Your brother, your son, your father, all four men gone. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. What of my beloved Nabi? And so. Someone said he is fine. He is wounded, but he is fine. He is returning. Now she says, I will not believe you. I cannot rest my heart until I lay eyes on my Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She ran out until she found him so she could find some peace in her heart. Brothers and sisters, may Allah increase our hearts with love, with tranquility, with attachment to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, we beg you to make us love him the way they loved him, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, increase our love for this great warrior the way they loved him, Ya Allah. Well, brothers and sisters, anything correct I've said is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything incorrect I've said is from me. Please forgive me for becoming emotional and um, and uh, let's pretend it didn't happen. Just just remember the words inshallah please. And wa akhiru dawa'an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair.